Threat Intelligence Week. Uh, make sure you guys sign in on the link tree. Um, yeah, I'll give you a little bit to do that. It's really important that everyone signs in so we can keep track of you know who's attending our meetings. Um, and then those metrics are important for us, but more importantly, we can expect like the load on our like infrastructure, how many people are gonna show up to do the labs and stuff. All right, everyone good? Everyone good? All right, nice. All right, remember to become a paid member for only like 20 bucks a semester. You can get all this cool stuff. Um, so remember to do that. Uh, also, um, remember to sign up for King of the Hill. Marshall can do your little, little blurb about it. Yeah. So as the name states, King of the Hill is a King of the Hill style event where your goal is to attack a bunch of different vulnerable machines, establish your flag, and prevent others from taking your spot. This event is aimed at anyone of any skill level, whether or not you have experience with pen testing, pen testing in cybersecurity or not. <clears throat> Let's see. That, that. And you can uh, you can sign up on either the link tree or uh, on the Swift website. Both of them will give you the same form. The form has the Discord, so I'd advise you join that. And if you have a team, you can sign up with your whole team. And if you don't, um, we can help find a team for you. This event's going to happen uh, both in person and remote on October twentieth or October twenty second, and the signups close on October twentieth, eleven fifty nine. Cool. Thank you, Marshall. Um, so this is where we're at. Uh, we're going to go over the MGM uh, recent incident. Um, and I brought my mentor here today to talk about that from Sony. Um, and then on Friday, we'll have a lab and we'll go over that later in the presentation. All right. So if you weren't here previously, our previous two weeks have been intro to pen testing and intro to Wireshark. The CTF for Wireshark is still open until this Friday. Um, so make sure you guys participate. Um, okay, so a brief introduction about me. Um, I'm the Sony Global Threat Intelligence intern. Uh, I'm also a third year in computer science. Uh, I'm a fourth year and most recently I was uh, ethical hacking intern at Visa. Nice. Okay, so this is our agenda for today. We have a brief introduction to what Threat Intel is. Uh, we'll have a guest speaker, uh, Q&A part, and then the lab instructions for this week's lab. All right, so starting off with what Threat Intelligence is. So Threat Intelligence is basically understanding your adversaries to better defend a company or a network. Um, this could be through a lot of things, which I'll cover a little later. Uh, but I think what sums it up is this quote by Sun Tzu. So know thy enemy and know yourself. In a hundred battles, you will never be defeated. Um, in cybersecurity, you could probably know your enemy as much as, much as you want, um, but you're still gonna get breached, but uh, it's good to always be prepared for uh, specific threat actors you're expecting to try to penetration test or get into your systems. So a few things that um, threat and intel concerns. Uh, we have dark web monitoring. So this is kind of like your, your view or your um, insight into threat actor activities. Um, this could be whether they're posting on forums or if they're trying to sell information or account credentials. Um, two different tools we could use for this is recorded future and also have I been pwned also um, uses dark web monitoring for its um, for its data as well. You also want to be monitoring the new vulnerabilities and exploits. This is uh, pretty easy. You could just go on different um, cyber news forums or articles, and you could see what might be applicable to your network or your company. Um, also more of understanding the threat actor point of view. You wanna look at their tools, tactics, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures, um, and their IOCs that they frequently use. Uh, a lot of times, IOCs and these TTPs um, are able to kind of give you insight into like what's going on in your network. So say if you have new IOCs from a different threat actor, you would want to run them on your systems to see if you have any hits or any, um, any cases of those IOCs. 
And then also understanding the TTPs is really important. Um, so you could prioritize what threat actors you want to try to defend against and um, see what uh, see what you want to implement on your network. Um, these could both be found through OSINT or just Googling uh, specific threat actors to find more information about like who they are and what they do. What are some like enterprise tools that like you would use? Like for example, um, we use, use yeah, we use CrowdStrike, uh, Falcon, CrowdStrike Recon. Um, yeah, but honestly, if you're not part of a corporate uh, or like an organization, it's kind of hard to get like premium research into um, these threat actors and these IOCs. Um, but yeah, so Googling it is your best bet as of now. Um, so continuing on to how threat intelligence kind of um, kind of connects with an organization, we have the threat intelligence life cycle. So this life cycle basically outlines um, the process through getting a request for information or um, a, a request for management uh, throughout dissemination or giving feedback to uh, what controls should be added or um, what the direction should be while moving forward in a cybersecurity uh, environment. Uh, so planning and direction is kind of identifying what you want to protect. So it's kind of minimizing your scope. So you could only look into a couple of things. So let's say your company uh, wants to prioritize uh, personal information. You would gear your research and your collection towards um, that one uh, that one value your company has. Uh, and then moving on to the collection phase, this is the actual research um, that you further analyze to uh, kind of massage for your company's own, um, own purposes. And then production is creating the reports and then the dissemination and feedback is actually spreading them and getting feedback to what's helpful and what might have not been helpful. All right, with that being said, uh, I will hand it off to Matt. Uh, which will give an overview of the MGM incident. Hey, thanks, Jimmy. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Seibert. I've been working in the threat intelligence space uh, for the better part of five or six years now, uh, most recently with Sony. Um, so Jimmy's been on our team helping us with all of our day-to-day -day tasks. Uh, and I wanted to talk about a little bit of what we do um, and then demonstrate some of the examples in the, the real world. Uh, Jimmy, are you able to give me co-host of the meeting so I can share screen? Yeah, give me a second. Yeah. Give me a second. yeah. I just gave it. I just gave it. Oh, nice. Thank you. Right, Thank you. Take care of that then. All right, cool. Too many windows. All right. So today I'm going to be briefing you about uh, the recent MGM breach that happened in Vegas. Uh, for those that may or may not be aware, um, this happened in early September. And uh, let's talk about it. So covering a little bit of uh, introduction, how the attackers got in, what MGM did about it, what the attackers did in response, and then the kind of public view of what MGM did versus like what was actually going on behind the scenes, what the impact of the attack was, uh, talk about some other attacks that happened in uh, Caesar's Palace, and then uh, wrap up on this one. So on the 7th of September, MGM was targeted by a, cy a cyber criminal group, crippled a ton of its systems. Um, and as a little bit of background, MGM, for those that haven't been to Vegas or aren't aware, uh, is a kind of a chain of resorts, kind of like Hilton or things like that. Um, they've got 29 different hotels and resorts under their umbrella, and they've got a valuation of about $30 billion and about 75,000 employees just in uh, the Nevada area. So talking about this attack specifically, what they did is they researched all of the IT, several key players that they thought they may be able to impersonate in order to get into the system. Wait, Max, Next thing they did. You, could you repeat that last part? Uh, you're kind of cutting out right now. Oh, one second. Let me try and switch networks right double quick. Yeah, all good, all good.
Oh, sorry, guys. Uh, I'm just answering questions right now. Uh, so the question was... Um, hey, sorry. Can you hear me okay? Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, all good. All good. You're good. All right. Could, could you give me a second? I'm answering a question right now. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank ahead. you so much, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so IOCs? Okay. So IOCs are like your indicators of compromise. So like I was saying before, it's what pairs the threat actor with the um, kind of with the system information and what you're reading from your logs and all your um, your solutions trying to collect data. Um, so if you run searches and you find these IOCs or file hashes or whatever on your systems, it might be something you want to look into, uh, especially if it's known for um, a specific threat actor that might be targeting you. Um, yeah, very important to look into. Okay, thank you, Matt. You can continue. Yeah, you bet. Let me share my screen back. Is my audio coming through okay now? Yep. Yes, it's perfect. Okay, sweet. All right, so basically what the threat actor did is they did some research on the um, staff that works at MGM, and they found some IT folks that were fairly high up in the organization, did some research on them, got some background about them, and then they called tech support. And they were like, hey, I'm having a problem getting into my system. This is Bob Smith. Um, I'm your, your IT like sub manager or someone like that. Somebody like not super high up, but someone high enough up that would have some access. So they social engineer their way past the support folks at MGM and get them to reset their MFA or their multi-factor authentication credentials, which is basically like when you try and log into something and it sends a, a password to your phone, like a one-time password that expires in a minute. Um, that's what they needed to get past. And so they managed to talk their way past uh, tech support into giving them that information or doing a reset on that. And from there, they were off to the races. So what the attackers did, they started by exploring the system. They're saying, okay, so we got in as Bob Smith, but what kind of access does Bob have? So they lateral themselves around, see what kind of systems they're, they're into. That's the reconnaissance phase of what we call the kill chain. So they've discovered they've got some pretty solid access. They get their way into the identity and authentication management system. They start installing backdoors. And then I'm going to talk about how they start breaking stuff and exfiltrating data in uh, some of the next slides. So for the public response, MGM wasn't aware of this breach for a day or two. But once it be they became aware of it, they basically said, hey, we're, uh, we're dealing with a cybersecurity incident that has affected some of the company's systems. Uh, resorts, including dining, entertainment, and gaming are all still totally operational. Everything is fine. Uh, behind the scene, not so much. So they detected that they had hackers in their what they, in their Okta system, which is again, the Identity and Access Management or IAM tool. And that's basically responsible for letting people in and verifying that you are who you say you are when you try and log on to the network. And basically they uh, figured out that the attackers had gotten access into the system and they just, they were like, yeah, let's just shut it all down. Uh, however, they didn't realize how broad the attackers had gotten. Uh, the attackers still had access. They had super admin within that Okta system. And they also had global admin in Azure, which is the cloud provider that MGM uses. Uh, so at that point, the attackers are kind of seeing like, oh, they're, they've realized that we're here and they've started just willy nilly, just setting things on fire, turning it all off, unplugging, just running through the server room, ripping cables out of the wall. Uh, so at that point, they decided to start exfiltrating data because they know they've been spotted so they can get loud. So they started exfiltrating a whole bunch of data. They started deploying some ransomware and then went pretty public about the whole operation. 
So the reality compared to what MGM was putting out there is once that kind of uh, trigger happened where MGM started shutting everything down and the attackers got into the cloud and started turning everything off or, or locking everything else down, a bunch of guests couldn't check in, couldn't check out, room cards, key cards, elevators didn't work. Gambling uh, was basically ground to a halt with the exception of stuff like uh, the physical stuff like cards or uh, roulette wheels and things like that. But even though they could still do that, they couldn't actually cash out without actually having to go to a person and fill out some actual paperwork, which was kind of hilarious. Uh, also disrupted the corporate email. They couldn't book hotel rooms. People online couldn't book anything. Um, restaurant reservation services were down. It was a proper, proper mess. Broad stroke impacts for this particular incident, about eight and a half million dollars a day for every day that the systems were down. Uh, we don't know and still don't and likely won't uh, to this point know what data was exfiltrated from MGM. And as a, a bit of a legal background, for all for every attack that you see in the news that happens, there are probably a dozen or more that you don't see. And it usually comes down to what's legally required for a company to do. So if a company was breached and uh, the, the hackers just stole a bunch of their internal documents and then ransomed them, uh, as long as those internal documents didn't have anything to do with customers' personally identifiable information like social security numbers or, or addresses or credit cards or things like that, odds are good the company's not going to talk about it to the press. It's bad for them. It's bad for their, their stock value and their customer um, confidence in them and all of those sorts of things. So they're just going to keep it hush-hush. They'll either rebuild their systems or they'll pay the ransom. Um, but in this case, MGM uh, had a very public outing with all of these systems going down and, and everybody making a big stink about it, they really didn't have a choice but to address it. So their reputation is damaged, their credit score is impacted. And again, we still don't and may never know what other data is out there from this breach. So I wanted to talk about the flow of the attack. So hopefully you can see my mouse cursor. Uh, so here's our attacker right here on the left side with the, the big uh, triangle over their head. So first they're doing their intelligence gathering. And this is kind of a chart that ends up getting built after the fact as an after action, but it's just a way to nicely visualize what the whole process was. So step two, they pick out their victims, those in high privileges systems, either through LinkedIn or through other social networks. Then they start doing what's called vishing. Everybody's heard of, of phishing as well, but if you swap out the first letters, there's a whole series of different other permutations of this uh, vishing and smishing and uh, things like that that have to do with social engineering somebody to click on something or, or give you access to something that they otherwise shouldn't. So in this case, they call up the MGM IT desk. They impersonate the privileged victim to basically say, hey, I'm locked out of my system. My phone fell in the toilet. I can't do my MFA authentication to get into my system. I need help. I need a one-time password and get in. And tech support says, okay, I mean, you are who you say you are. You have all the background. You've verified your social security number and your mother's maiden name and all that sort of stuff, which they were able to scrape through this uh, open source background check. Uh, and they answered all the security questions and IT said, okay, here you go. And, and so then they were in and they were able to compromise and get super uh, admin creds and even more administrator credentials. And then they spider out. This is that reconnaissance phase where they start figuring out what they can reach out and touch. So they gain domain administration on their domain controllers. They get admin on the Okta server. They get global admin in their cloud environment. And then they start working the system for everything it's worth. They start exfiltrating sensitive data, likely. Then when MGM figures out what's happening and they start shutting doors, uh, they're still in the system because they've got super admin and they run through and start encrypting a bunch of their cloud servers, uh, disrupting all their uh, VMs or virtual machines that a bunch of services run on. And this would be the things like the reservation system within the, the company's website. If you're trying to book a hotel room, that's likely run on in the cloud on a VM somewhere. And so they're running through and encrypting all these servers and just literally setting things on fire or figuratively, I should say. Um, and so that's kind of where this thing really blew up in the press. I wanted to talk, so that's basically the, the process flow for that attack. And I wanted to cover one that didn't really make as much noise as the other, uh, and that was Caesar's Palace. This, this attack occurred just prior to MGM. I'm talking like a few days. Um, there was a, allegations that it was the same threat actor, but the actual threat actors themselves like to talk and like to claim one thing or the other. And in this case, the threat actor that they identified um, as Scattered Spider uh, by CrowdStrike, which is one of the intelligence providers. They basically name all the threat actors and give them all names. 
Um, so they identified this one as scattered spider and they talked to scattered spider on Twitter and, or X or whatever. And they said they didn't do the Caesar's palace attack, but based on the kind of target demographic and timeline, uh, I'm not convinced. In this case, instead of just kind of lurking in there and seeing what they can find, what they did is they got right in there and they stole the loyalty program database. So the loyalty program database has got, uh, so in order to gamble in Vegas, uh, you have to submit a driver's license, social security number, because all of those winnings and losses, uh, as in, the, I mean, the house does always win, that's all taxable. And so they have to have a paper trail for all of that stuff. And part of that goes into the loyalty program and the hackers grabbed it. So you've got driver's license, social security numbers, personal identifiable information, credit card numbers, address, cell phone, like all that stuff. And that comes to part of what I was talking about earlier about a legal obligation to disclose when things like this happen to big organizations like Caesars to basically say, hey, we got hacked. Um, we have to tell you because customer's information is out in the wild. Somebody got it and they're ransoming us for it. So the attackers basically said, okay, well, you can have your data back for the low, low price of $30 million. Uh, Caesars goes back and forth. They bring their lawyers in, they negotiate it down to 15 million. But again, uh, not a cheap date, but probably not a backbreaker for a group like Caesars. So other data was also stolen. Caesars, again, has not disclosed the nature of that information as they are not obligated to. Um, this attack was also carried out through social engineering. In this case, there was an outside vendor. So Caesars Palace and, and groups like that, even Sony, we don't do everything in house. So there are companies that specialize in these kinds, uh, in subs, in like sub aspects of security. So like we were talking, Jimmy was talking earlier about CrowdStrike. So CrowdStrike does intelligence gathering and they produce reports on the latest and greatest of things out there. And we are a customer of theirs. And so in this case, one of the uh, providers to Caesars was actually the one who got compromised. And, and they, uh, they lateraled that compromise of that external vendor into a compromise of Caesars Palace. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some uh, behind the scenes discussions between lawyers about uh, who's actually paying that $15 million ransom. But again, that's just kind of speculation. So conclusion about this particular breach. So the primary attack vector in 90% of these breaches is people. It depends on who and how they do it. But typically speaking, it's either through a fish or through social engineering or through uh, vishing or smishing, which is through smishing is where you send a, uh, an SMS text message and uh, you go that way and you're like, oh, my boss sent me this link I'm supposed to click. Oh, I've got to log into my, my Outlook or, or whatever. And then they've got your credentials and they can jump into your account and do all kinds of bad things. Um, one of the ones that I've seen recently is people sending um, a QR code. That's that big kind of like pixelated two-dimensional barcode through email. And so those things don't get picked up by the scanners for viruses and things like that. Cause you're like, Oh, it's just a picture. It's not a big deal. It's not an attachment. It's not a document file with some embedded malware. It's just a picture. It's not a big deal. And then somebody pulls out their phone because they're like, I'm not going to figure out how to do this on my computer. And they'll click on it. Uh, when they scan it with their camera and then they're outside of their corporate networks that might have stopped it are all gone. Cause now you're on your phone and it doesn't exist there. So that's one of the latest ways that I've seen um, people get compromised or have their credentials uh, stolen or leaked is through weird things like that. So one of the things for takeaways for this particular breach, we were recommending and need to go back and uh, review our access controls. So if somebody in IT has that level of clearance where they could literally lateral themselves into control of the entire network, that kind of activity, even at that level, needs to be pretty intensely monitored. Uh, second is uh, training. So training, especially for those support personnel that have the rights to reset somebody's second or two-factor credentials, um, they need to be very well trained on the kinds of compromises that can happen because one person slip up, they click the button that hit reset or grant temporary password or what have you, and that just completely opened the company up. And last is the MFA best practices. There's some identity access management. So once somebody got in, uh, they shouldn't be able to get triple ultra super mega admin credentials with the same level of rights that they just used to log into the system. That should be, again, a separate level, uh, some more segmentation, some more separation, bringing additional levels of credentials into uh, the process. But those, again, are just the, the takeaways from 
something bad happening to somebody else. But that's the best time that you can do your learning is watching things get set on fire for <laughs> next door. So what do we do uh, as threat intelligence folks? So I'm gonna walk through some of the attack methods research that we can do, um, but we're also learning from their mistakes, right? So figure out what those attack vectors are, how do we patch them? Or maybe if they use the same ransomware and they manage to get through our, our nets and things like that, make sure that we're aware of the, the latest and greatest in the ransomware that's out there so that if they get through and we didn't notice and they try and deploy it, we need to be made aware and, and cut that off the pass, right? Adjust our security infrastructure, kind of like I was talking on the last slide about adjusting how and who has credentials for what. So I wanted to jump into a different uh, set of information. So what you would do from a threat intelligence perspective, we hear a story or we read something or we see something in our feed that says, hey, MGM's got breached. And we say, okay, let's go find some reports. So I'll go to Google. Uh, there's a whole bunch of news aggregation sites out there. Bleeping Computer is a good one. Um, so I'll search MGM breach and say, okay, MGM casinos, servers, uh, allegedly encrypted and ransomware attack. Okay, good place to start. They've always got really cool graphics. So this will be a, just kind of a general gist of the attack, what kind of uh, compromises were used, the different groups that have been involved. Here's the reference to the Caesars Entertainment breach that also happened. And the same in time frame, but I'm, this isn't really actionable. So I'll pivot around and see who else is reporting on it. And I kind of go, okay, so the V admin. Uh, okay, so I'll say like, if I don't know who did it, maybe I can find the ransomware itself. So this is unit 42 uh, out of Palo Alto and they do also a really good job with security research. So, okay, now I'm reading about this. Black Cat is a ransomware family uh, surfaced mid-November, 2021. Okay, their ransomware is a ransomware as a service. So I'm sure the as a service model is fairly familiar to uh, many of you, but ransomware as a service is where you've got a major organization from the cybercrime perspective that is basically providing this on a subscription. They say, hey, we're not gonna operate the ransomware itself, but for a low, low fee slash pretty moderate fee, uh, we will provide it to you along with some tech support uh, so as to distance ourselves from what, like, we don't know what you're going to do with it. I mean, we probably know what you kind of things you're going to do with it. We're, we're, gonna, we're not involved. We're, we're just selling you the ammunition. We're not pulling the trigger. Uh, and so they're basically providing that to a cost. Uh, so, okay. So what can we find out about Black Cat? Well, like Jimmy was mentioning earlier, there are what we call indicators of compromise. So those are basically like fingerprints for this specific uh, piece of software. And they have them listed here as the indicators here. So uh, for those that are unfamiliar, these are what are called file hashes. And that's a fingerprint for a file. They basically run it through an algorithm. Uh, you take the code, you run it through the algorithm, and you get one of these hex values out. This is a list of whatever, 30, 35 different hash values of different files that are associated with the Black Cat ransomware. But what can you do with this? So I can take one of these, and I can go to uh, one of our myriad different tools. In this case, I'm going to go to VirusTotal. I'm going to drop it in, and uh, VirusTotal is a centralized repository of all things known bad or otherwise bad. Um, and so what I'm going to do is drop it into here and see what VirusTotal says. And so what VirusTotal is is a community of security researchers that will come up and basically say, hey, I found this thing on my network. Uh, um, Matt, you're kind of cutting out again. Uh, could you restart from like starting from the virus total part? I don't know what it is. Yo, Matt. This Matt, Matt, can you hear me? <laughs> Damn, that's crazy. But I think it's doing doing bad things. And hey, Matt. So they were fire total. Um, Matt. Hello? Hello? Uh oh. Let's try this a third time. Okay, thank you. All right, nice, nice. I just got, I just got Starlink last week and uh, it's, it's working pretty well, but I'm finding some shortcomings. So, yeah, you're good. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yes, yes. Right on, right on. 
All right, so a little bit of background on VirusTotal. So VirusTotal is a central repository where a bunch of security researchers will submit files that they've seen on their network. So you can see here's an executable file that somebody found on their network and they submitted it up to VirusTotal and then it runs through all of these engines. So these are a whole series of groups that will automatically run this piece of whatever that somebody has uploaded and see what they can figure out about it. And so you can see a lot of tags where it's like malware, virus, Win32, uh, Trojan Stealer, Ransom, Win32. So like this is obviously some, some badness. And you can see down here for like Icarus, they've identified that there are some similarities between this tool and other pieces of Black Cat malware. And so they've built a definition for it. And if you actually click on it, you can find out more about the, their, their detection tool. There's also a whole community that's talking about this particular um, their file and what's going on with it. And so you can see all of the uh, discussions about this particular group. Uh, one of the other cool things you can do is you can look at how it's, you can look at the details of the file, like when it was created, uh, any names that it might have associated with it. But I think the, the relations tab is probably the most, most uh, useful piece. Oops, I clicked on something I shouldn't have. And so the relations tab will actually identify which of the other files or infrastructure this file communicates with. So it talks to this domain, which we could also look into. Um, it talks, it, it reaches out to these IP addresses. It's got a bunch of uh, URLs that are embedded within it, like the Tor project. Um, that's the onion router for those that are unfamiliar. That's one of those like internet obfuscation, dark web. When everybody talks about the dark web, that's what they're talking about is, is uh, the onion router or Tor. Um, with a free, anybody can get a subscription to VirusTotal, it's free. Um, there are more complex tools that you can get when you have the kind of premium version of virus total and one of them is the graph which is kind of a cool way to uh, get lost down a rabbit hole um, but the graph takes the initial indicator that you were looking at and then starts to spider out and pivot into the other relational things that virus total is aware of so as soon as this starts to or as soon as this finishes building i can show you what some of the aspects of this uh, graph are so you can see in the center of the graph is the executable that we found the hash for and because VirusTotal knows what this hash is, it builds a relational database around this hash and can tell us a whole lot about it. So the hash is listed in a whole series of uh, other reports or collections. And so we can see there's a Microsoft Exchange servers hacked. And you can see here in the descriptions, uh, Microsoft says Black Cat ransomware affiliates are using Exchange servers uh, to exploit unpatched vulnerabilities and things like that. Um, you can see similar files. So these are files that might share um, a compilation date or an author that somebody's identified. In this case, you can see it's got that black cat tag as well associated with, uh, with that. The other nice thing is if you see something in here that you can say, okay, this looks a little bit weird. Oh, that's just the Tor project. Here, this is that domain that we had found earlier, right? The pcsdl.com. Somebody's identified this as malicious, which is why it's red. So we can click on it and we can see all of the things it's related to. So there's 95 files that have been downloaded from that domain. There's some SSL certificates that are associated with it, some NS records, IPs that it resolves to, some subdomains or associated URLs. And you're like, okay, show me what that looks like. So you just double click on this piece and it'll actually spider that out. And the cool thing is, is you can see where there are links between the two clusters. So you can see that there's uh, some IP address infrastructure that is shared by uh, this one IP address right here is shared by the two, uh, the hash and this domain. And you can start to build a bit of a profile about these two different things. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to mention is uh, where we put this information. So we've got this huge map of this network, like what do we do with it? So at Sony, what we do is we drop it into uh, our what's called a threat intelligence platform. So this is Threat Connect. And I can show you what the kind of splash screen on this looks like. But what Threat Connect does is it houses, it's a central repository for all of these indicators of compromise, as well as the reports that we can find or generate about these threat groups, right? So it allows us to centralize all of that information, as well as link it all together, write out reports for leadership about the, the goings and comings of the uh, different actors that are out there as well as tie things together. So uh, I can show you the main page in just a second, but this is one of those hashes that we look for, right? 
And so the overview of this uh, hash, it'll tell us kind of where it came from, um, what's going on with it, how, how it works, who's taught how much we should care about it. So in this case, it's rated five out of five. So we, this is what it, we say it is. So this is 95 out of 100 confirmed extra bad. So almost all the way up there on the uh, bad reputation. And so there's, uh, Jimmy's been working on some, uh, what we call tags. So tags are basically little bits of metadata that we can uh, stick on to these indicators to correlate them with other similar ones. So we're saying, hey, what's Black Cat been doing? And maybe if the re reporting that we found doesn't have everything we need, we can go through these tagging uh, and kind of pivot our way to uh, the information we might care about. And that's more of the associations over here. So what other files or domains is this associated with? And we can see the same 35 uh, indicators that Unit 42 had, but we can also use this as a jump off point to uh, discover other things that we might be interested in. And the last thing that this does for us that's very helpful is we feed this into our detection algorithms that basically say, if we see this hash come across our network, somebody downloads it, somebody clicks on a file and it gets, or clicks on a link and it gets dropped on their machine or it's an attachment for an email, like what are we doing with this? Um, so if it reaches a certain threshold for confidence and threat rating, we're going to send an alert to our incident response folks and say, hey, this is something we need to fix. Like something bad's going on. Run this to ground. And they will then hand off and they might uh, hit us up and basically be like, hey, we saw this hash. We don't have a lot of information on it. Like, what can you tell us? And we'll go dive and dig and see what we can find and feed it back to them. So that is the start to finish of kind of the day in the life for threat intelligence folks, as well as a nice uh, little example of what's been going on um, recently in the space. What kind of questions can I help answer for the group? Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, we have a question in Discord. Um, oh, nice. It was, was it disclosed if MGM had any sort of detection logic implemented for highly privileged Okta accounts or Okta service accounts? Not that they told us about. And I'm guessing it wasn't functioning well since someone was able to either create or otherwise escalate the account that they had into a super user account and they didn't know. So I would say there was also some claims that the plate, because uh, as an incident responder, when things are on fire, there's typically what they call a playbook that you'll pull off the shelf digitally or physically that basically outlines what you're supposed to do in this kind of incident. So if they had an incident where they've got a breach um, somebody's creds got reset and they're potentially the calls coming from inside the house now. Uh, they have a set of protocols that they should be following and either they didn't follow them or their protocols were out of date because they should have noticed the kind of escalation and privilege creation that these attackers likely did in order to gain that level of access. Because if they figured out whose account was initially compromised, they would just shut it off. Um, but it sounds like they created new accounts or escalated their own accounts uh, or escalated other accounts to the point where they could then take control. So they probably had something, but it didn't work as intended. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, does anyone in the room have any questions? Uh, if not, we have another Zoom question. Would you have recommended forced... FIDO2 implementation for those accounts? That's a genuinely good question. I, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't actually worked with FIDO2 before. I know it's, I've heard about it as far as a, like an alliance for MFA and things like that. Um, can you, I'm just doing some okay, you're you're cutting out a little bit again. Understand it a little bit better. So it looks like an auth MFA. Okay, it's a term for passwordless. That's oh, fine. Um, it looks like another example enforce. I don't know if that's going to help or not. It's probably best. Pra it, it is definitely best practice to enforce multi-factor if you can't um, do such a thing. Then you need to limit the access that those people have. Uh, to the critical system, certainly. All right, cool. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, you bet. Cool. Uh, we're running low on time, so we'll do a little intro to the lab um, real quick. Um,
Um, so for this week's lab, we Jimmy and I were brainstorming really hard to try to make this as like interesting as possible and um and like allow you guys to interact with the environment in as many ways as possible. So it's gonna be kind of like a mix between um threat intelligence and IR. You're gonna have to do a little digging, um, look for the logs yourself and and correlate that. Um, so the threat intel part will really be like the deliverable. Um, so the objective of the, of the lab is to find as many TTPs for the threat actors um, as you can. So we'll give you a list of like a threat actor database um, and you're gonna have to correlate the activity to the threat actor that you think uh, hacked orbital weapons. Um, so you'll be provided with a copy of our environment. This will be done through Camino. Um, in the workshop channel in Swift, there's a guide for how to use Camino. Basically you just register your account and then um, create like clone your environment from um, you should see threat intel workshop. Um, that's the correct environment. Um, and then you'll also be provided with a document of the threat actor profiles. So there's gonna be four different threat actors that um, are potentially the, the one who caused all this carnage. Um, so there's gonna be some like IOCs and some of their like uh, repeated behaviors that have been demonstrated across other things that they've done. Um, so you're gonna have to correlate that and see if, uh, kind of come up with a proposal of like who the person you think is. Um, and then there's also going to be a briefing document. Within that document, there's uh, information such as like more information about the environment, a little background about what happened, and then um, some articles of evidence from IR. We don't have everything yet because they're investigating the incident as we're correlating this evidence. So you're gonna have to help them um, find like the logs that are uh, part, like that would correlate to those to what happened and then also write a report. So your report should talk about who you think threat actor is, kind of like the logic behind that. And then also all the logs that have that were associated. Sorry about that. Um, so then this is a brief overview of the environment. There's a Windows host, there's a domain controller, uh, there's a Microsoft like Exchange server. So that's the um, email server. And then there's a web server. Um, that's a, an Ubuntu box. And the two that you would, you would want to focus on are the Windows 10 host and the Ubuntu box. Um, and then these the three accounts on the right are the accounts that are valid for this environment. And then all the passwords are the same. So just try to pull as many logs as you can and try to put together a timeline of what happened. And that's your deliverable. This is all um, on our Discord in the workshop channel. So please reach out to me or Jimmy if you have any questions about the lab. Um, so on Friday, we're going to go over what happened and then also share our deliverables. All right. Thank you guys so much. We got an hour. I got a class coming in at one.